Hi everybody, welcome back. It's been a while since I posted a video, at least it feels like that to me. Um, I hope you enjoyed the Bloody Chamber. I hope you read it all. I know it's kind of a lot, but uh, it's a really, really interesting story. So I'm going to try to talk you through some of my thoughts on the Bloody Chamber. Um, obviously it's really long and it's really packed with detail. So um, forgive me if I kind of jump all over the place, but I want to start with the beginning of the story. Um, to me, the opening of the story really sets the tone for the whole tale. Uh, a young girl going away. We have this word here, away, um, into the, um, quote, unguessable country of marriage right here. Um, so she mentions going away in a few different ways that all foreshadow the story. Um, she says that she is going away from Paris, a city that she knows. Um, a large city perhaps representing culture and civilization as opposed to the night that she um, mentions here. And this calls to mind a kind of typical fairy tale trope to me um, of like the child leaving the safety of the parent's house and then going out into the woods or out into the world. We've seen that before. Um, she's going away from girlhood um, here. Um, She's young. She'll, she, although she's young now, she's going to be a woman. She's going to be a wife. She's kind of entering the world of um, adulthood in a different way. Um, she's going f away from the white enclosed quietude of my mother's apartment. Um, this calls to mind a lot of things. So um, apparently the apartment is white, but we have that, that word again, white as, a, white as uh, it calls to mind purity. Um, that's a theme of um, Angela Carter's young female protagonist. We saw this with Red in the Company of Wolves. Um, white kind of equals, again, white equals purity. Purity equals um, virginity. Um, and Red in the Company of Wolves, her virginity was specifically mentioned a few times. This story is sexual as well, obviously. Um, another theme of Angela Carter's is the underlying sexual implications of these tales. And then finally, this word here, quietude. Um, this calls to mind um, like peace and safety um, in her mother's apartment. And through all of these things, she's moving into the unguessable country of marriage. And I would say that's a big theme in the story, this idea of um, marriage or adulthood or what it means to be a woman um, in, in a marriage during these times, at least, is um, the experience can't be known until... Uh, until the woman takes part in it. So again, I would, I would argue that um, this very short opening paragraph, um, similar, to, uh, similar to the next story you're gonna read, Bluebeard's Egg, um, kind of sets up some of the central elements of the story. We have a young woman moving from childhood to adulthood through this hasty or arranged marriage to a man she doesn't really know. Um, the fact that in a relationship like marriage, one gets to know a partner's inner life um, and that closeness to something foreign can be frightening or anxiety inducing. Also, I would say the young bride in the story realizes that, um, however close you get to someone, you can never kind of truly know their inner life or experience of the world. Um, that's one of the things I kind of like to talk about in my literature classes. One of the things I think literature can teach us is that it doesn't always have to be this negative but that no matter how well you know a person, there's only so close you can get to understanding their experience of the world or, how, or their experience of themselves. No matter what, um, no matter how close you get to a person, your experience is always separate from and different from theirs. Um, that comes up again in different stories in different ways. Um, yeah, so that closeness to something foreign can be frightening um, or anxiety inducing. Um, and then there, and then another really important thing that I'm going to talk about um, during this screencast is that there's a power element to all of this, um, and some of that power is related to sexuality. So I asked you to talk in your observations about the bride's character traits, and so I'll kind of start with that. I haven't read your discussion post yet. I'll try to get to some of that today and tomorrow, but uh, I wanted to do this this first. Um, so I'm sure you noticed a lot of these um, same traits. So the bride, um, simply because of the facts of her life, inherently embodies a lot of the traditional gender role elements of a desirable female in fairy tales. 
just like Red in The Company of Wolves, she's young, of a marriage age, but she's innocent or pure or a virgin still. Um, she's beautiful, and in this story, we might say she's um, somewhat inexperienced, and this comes up again. But again, things are a little different with her as they are different with Beauty in The Tiger's Bride um, and with some small plot moments of the story. On the first page, we learn that she is a little defiant, and instead of being obedient and loyal to her mother, she's anxious to shake off her parental shackles and be an adult female out in the world. She kind of relishes or enjoys her escape from mother and from childhood. This is a pretty good representation of young adults getting out of the house and on their own for the first time, that feeling of freedom. Um, most teenagers wouldn't describe it in these same words, but I bet you can relate on some level. Um, and given the social constructs of an earlier time, like in these stories, there's this idea that um, marriage is the only way a young girl can escape the house. So an example of the bride feeling like this again starts in the first line of the story. Um, she, uh, let's see, with that list of all the things she's going away from, she prefaces it by saying she felt a delicious ecstasy of excitement right here. Um, and at all these things, all the things that she's going away from. She, later, she adds to this by mentioning her bridal triumph. Um, I'm not sure if this is on this page or elsewhere. She mentions her bridal triumph, revealing more about how she feels about this wedding to a very rich and powerful man escaping her old life. Um, she admits to a pang of loss right here as she ceased to become her mother's child and becoming the Duke's wife. Um, so that would be one character trait that to me is kind of hard to name starting there. So she has all these traditional gender role traits, but she's also a little defiant toward her mother. She's a little arrogant about this marriage. Um, she's a little drunk on something like power or status. She feels like she'll gain by being married to this powerful, wealthy man. So still talking about the bride here and, um, kind of the complicated way, how she feels. Um, I jumped just to the next page of the story. Um, I know the editing here is terrible, um, but I, I've just made my peace with the fact that I'm not gonna have time to make it look good. Um, so I'm just gonna bounce around in the story a little bit. So she is both young and inexperienced, but, um, but she feels some kind of like rush or anticipation um, of leaving her mother and like her childish ways. So um, right here on the second page, I just mentioned there's a sexual element to the story. We start to learn quickly that she's kind of anticipating the sexual element of marriage as well. She seems a little scared of it, but she also seems to enjoy feeling desired. She mentions in this paragraph here on the screen, um, she mentions wearing her nightdress in the sleeping car of the train and imagining the forthcoming wedding night as being voluptuously uh, voluptuously deferred, um, that's right here, voluptuously deferred. Um, so again, this is related to the idea that her marriage is like some kind of, of triumph and she's entering into this um, strange, strange, unknowable country, but um, she's also looking forward to it. And she's looking forward to being a, a woman instead of a young girl. Um, so I think this too is a complicated power thing that she's beginning to feel. She's moving from being a child with little control over her world to being a woman who is desired by a powerful man simply for being what she is, young, beautiful, and worthy of being desired. And it's worth mentioning too, um, her mother, the bride's mother, um, provides kind of an interesting foil um, for the daughter. So. Um, she works against traditional gender type in some ways. She's strong, independent, kind of traditionally masculine. Like when we meet her on this first page, here she's described as eagle-featured, indomitable, which literally means she can't be dominated. It's impossible to dominate her. But in terms of the dictionary, it means impossible to subdue or defeat. You might have heard this pseudo-cliche, indomitable spirit, which means a spirit that just can't be put down. And she's described quickly as essentially superhuman. She had outfaced a junk full of Chinese pirates, nursed a village through a visitation of the plague, shot a man-eating tiger with her own hands. And um, spoiler alert, we all know, since we definitely 100% read the entire story, 
that it is the mother who saves the bride at the end. And again, that uh, she shot a man-eating tiger, um, that kind of almost seems like foreshadowing for um, shooting the Duke, who is kind of a woman-eating beast. Um, so interestingly here, um, the mother kind of works against fairy tale gender role type when she advocates marrying for love, not money. Parental figures in these fairy tales thus far have kind of been like, do what's best for the family and put yourself aside. We have um, Beauty, who is expected to be selfless, you know, and who is uh, in the original tale, who puts aside like her own needs to save her father and to save the, and to make the family rich. Um, that's kind of the fairy tale foundation. But in these Angela Carter stories, that stuff gets reversed. So when the mother here in um, the bloody chamber is like, don't worry about money, you should be marrying for love. But the daughter, uh, her, the bride, seems to want power and status more than love, kind of defiantly. Um, yes, another uh, terrible jumpy edit there. Um, but yeah, on this page, uh, the bride describes her mother as beggaring herself for love. Um, and seems, and she seems, the bride seems hell-bent on avoiding the same fate. She does not want to make herself poor for love. Um, but this kind of raises a couple questions. Then, if instead of being poor for love, the bride will be rich for something other than love. So what is that other thing here? Um, what does the Duke want her for, if not exactly love? Um, I might argue that the bride doesn't know what she's getting into here. Again, she can only imagine and has a vague idea of what married um, life with the Duke will be like, but what she imagines is opulence. And opulence is like great wealth and luxury. She imagines an escape from childish things. She imagines adulthood and independence. But what I might argue is if she is not marrying for love, she's marrying into a contract she can't really fathom or understand. She's marrying to willingly become an object to be toyed with. Um, yes, sexually, but also in many more ways. Um, I would argue that she simply becomes an object for the, dirt, the Duke to exert his power on in different ways. She has almost become a specimen in a collection for him, for him to subject to experiments and see how she reacts. Um, and this, this idea of um, power, like I use the word specimen, so scientists collect specimens, like entomologists collect specimens, and they subject them to experiments, they look at them, they preserve them, um, they make objects out of them, essentially. Um, there's a scene in Bluebeard's Egg coming up that's really important where uh, this woman's husband takes her to a hospital, he's a doctor, takes her to a hospital and connects her up to a machine where he can look at her heart. And there's this really, it, she is not really a person anymore in that scene. She's just, a, she's like a creature, like an object. Uh, and he kind of manipulates her and describes her um, and describes her heart beating and things like that in this really kind of um, impersonal way. It's an important scene. So I would argue that, um, the young bride in this story also becomes a type of um, specimen um, in a lot of different ways. Um, you can you can probably see how that plays out. Um, okay, I'm going to pause this video for a second, and I'll see you in the next one where I'm going to start off with talking about the Duke.